For decades online, Flash creators put out games for free, experimenting and refining their craft to see what worked. Usually, if anyone hit upon anything big, getting high scores, good word of mouth, plenty of views, meant that it was generally in their best interest to make sequels, capitalizing on whatever name recognition it may have had. Sponsorship and ad revenue kept that approach alive for many years. As the landscape began to change, and monetization options were not as readily available developers either moved on from Flash or from development entirely, and current web developers tend to more often make standalone titles, building up a personal portfolio without much incentive to make sequels unless you really want to. This is a video dedicated to those Flash developers who not only stuck with it for years, committing fully to their own specific successful series, but who have taken it a step beyond that and made the leap from online web game to full-fledged releases. How's it going guys? My name's Graham and this is Flashlight, the series dedicated to all things Flash related. My hope with this video is to share this information with you in a relatively quick and snappy way to give you that hit of nostalgia that you can then point towards some hungry developers. For each series on this list, I'll give a brief overview detailing what the Flash series was, the different installments of it, what the continuation is that went beyond the browser and where to find it, as well as reviews on that latest installment to help you judge whether it feels that it lives up to what you remember from the Flash based classic and if it feels worth spending any of your dough on. In no specific order, I'm starting with Ray. The original Ray Part 1 dates back to October 2003, so it's rounding the corner of its 20th anniversary, which means the game is actually notably older now than its creator was at the time. Phil JC was only 16 years old when he made this game. Combine that with the clear influences of early South Park in its style and absurdism with themes and characters that would feel at home in Grand Theft Auto, and it all thoroughly explains the edgier humor that rears its head throughout this series. There's cursing, guns, violence, drugs, double crossing, interrogations, and a surprising amount of action. It's got some clunky UI and a lot of typos, but it still holds up surprisingly well, except for a few things that have become notably dated. The sequel, Ray Part 2, released 11 months later, going bigger, louder, crazier, and overall just more more polished than the first. Keep in mind, this would still be coming from a high schooler. This pair of point-and-click, choose-your-own-adventure style games have gathered well over 6 million plays on Newgrounds alone. Both games coincidentally managed to earn Newgrounds' daily feature and weekly second trophy. Nearly two full years later after that, Phil dropped a trailer for Ray Part 3. It had more detailed environments, character designs, animation, lip-syncing, and voice acting. Generally, it's a huge step up on every possible front. Phil was also refining his own comedic chops, finding room for more gags, stepping aside from exclusively shocking or offensive punchlines. This was a teaser made to serve as an introduction to that third game, and it was already 12 minutes long. Funnily enough, it managed to pick up the daily first and weekly second. It's just so wildly unlikely to have that happen on all three submissions within a series, so I felt compelled to draw attention to it. Ray 3 was intended to be a prequel to the other games, showing us how Ray became the hardened thug we came to know in the previous pair of games. Phil was aiming to have 60 minutes of animation for the final game. Unfortunately, he lost his files when moving homes, then needing to reformat his PC, assuming backups were available. Everything was lost. Work began anew on Ray 3 from scratch with a whole new art style to boot. But a full 10 years later, a formal cancellation of the Ray series was announced. Though it wasn't for a lack of trying. I plan to do a full flashlight video on the history of this series later on in the year, and I can save the nitty gritty details of that saga for then. Shortly after the announcement of that cancellation, Phil re-emerged with early details of his next project. 
This took shape as Ray's spiritual successor, now known as Repellafella, a game that takes everything Phil spent 15 years, including the 10 years working on the various versions of Ray 3, in pursuit of his dream game, learning and refining, now being applied to an all new choose your own adventure. Again, it's filled with violence, absurdism, and a sharp Aussie sense of humor, set in a post apocalyptic world where every single turn seems to present something new and unexpected. After working on this game for five years, animating five hours of cutscenes, blowing that previous goal of one hour out of the water, working with 70 plus voice actors to voice the entire game, including branching storylines and multiple endings to add to the replayability, this game is set to rival many big studio releases, and it's almost entirely still being done solo by Phil. This game is currently at that five yard line, or you know, some sort of cricket equivalent term for the Aussies, and it's due to be released later this year. And it's at this point I should mention, Two Left Thumbs is serving as a publisher for this game, helping Phil complete this project without needing to compromise his vision. What? You shout at the screen as you learn you've been stealthily advertised to? But hopefully it's an intriguing and informative advertisement at least. I promise I have no involvement with any of the other games on this list, and I'm instead attempting to promote them altruistically because I simply love Flash and indie games. But yeah, I'm gonna take the opportunity to plug one that I am involved in. Repellafella is not yet released, so I can't share reviews of the game, but I can let you know that a free demo will be available on Steam in the coming weeks. So be sure to give it a wishlist and follow if you want to learn more. It both signals to Steam that people are interested in the game, helping boost it in their own algorithm, while also allowing you to be notified as soon as that demo is available, so you can find out what all the fuss is about firsthand. So keep an eye out for that demo this summer, a full flashlight on the history of Ray later this year, and hopefully a release of Repellafella towards the end of 2022. Next up, the Decision series. This is actually the one that inspired creating this list. My full video that I did on the Last Stand zombie series gained some traction recently and got players reminiscing about other zombie flash games they love. And mixed in with those comments, someone pointed out that Decision is now available on Steam, but I'll talk about that after. The Decision series started back in 2012, coming from Fly Anvil, and features four Flash games. While it's easy to see now, the appreciation for this series has grown over time, with that original game sitting at a 4.48 out of 5, which is a very high score on Newgrounds, it still somehow managed to miss out on all daily or weekly awards. I went in search of what else was submitted that day, and it was nothing that has endured anywhere near as well as Decision has. It's funny how often that works out. Newgrounds is one of the only sites I know that consistently favors quality over everything else. While submissions will still fly under the radar on occasion, the community is a motivated collective of enthusiasts seeking out the best of the best and raising up deserving games through sheer word of mouth and force of will. I think the initial game may have first been overlooked because it was uh, just another zombie game. But really, this series looked at all the different zombie genre games out there, including the survival horrors, action games, arena shooters, or strategic defense games, and said, yep, there's a little bit of each to be found mixed into this undead cocktail. Although, considering the series is titled Decision, you'd expect there to be a lot more deciding. The game is excellent still, but it rarely feels like you're making important trade-offs that would warrant such a title or be expected of a zombie survival game. The first decision alone can easily take several hours to play through, as you move from one area to the next, completing a variety of missions, upgrading your gear, weapons, and abilities along the way. Mission types include recon, capturing factories and towers, defending your position, locating generators, and wiping out zombie hordes. Really, all missions boil down to wiping out zombie hordes, but, you know, some of them are a little more specific. It has fairly simple top-down controls, but additions like the ability to strafe or swap control schemes help it feel much more polished. 
Decision 2, New City, was largely more of the same, but as with the first installment, a variety of weapons, upgrades, and missions keep things from ever feeling stale. There were new enemy types and a wider branching upgrade tree that greatly expanded things. And the overall presentation felt sharpened, with brighter coloring that kept the same grim dark feel without needing to squint at anything, and it had more responsive controls. Definitely an upgrade, but a fairly small step forward. Still, the series was catching on and pulled the daily first and weekly fourth prizes, also notably earning three times more views on Newgrounds than the original. Fly Anvil shook things up, surprising everyone in 2014 with a new game in the series going in a totally new direction. Maybe zombies and post-apocalyptic settings were feeling a little played out by then, so were instead thrown into a medieval fantasy setting. No more tech, shotguns, snipers, or hunting for generators. Now it's crossbows, catapults, and swords. You still have to kill zombies, but also orcs, werewolves, and trolls. It keeps the top-down action and survival mechanics that are slowly starting to tip closer to feeling true to that name of decision. And when exploring, you might also find and rescue survivors to bring home so they can share their knowledge and help you advance specific skills. The variety present in this game on all fronts is next level. Level. Some of the UI can be a little clunky, and the blending of the 3D and 2D art styles isn't perfect, but damn impressive for a free browser game. Overall, it's incredibly deep, and if you choose to play through these games yourself, I not only highly recommend this one, as it's definitely a personal favorite out of this series, but it also gives you this nice palette cleanse before moving back into the futuristic zombie territory. This medieval entry did the best yet, picking up a daily first and weekly second. It's a wild and weird world seeing all these different things coexist, and it just makes it an absolute blast. Another 10 months after that, in 2015, was Decision 3, formally returning to that original post-apocalyptic setting. Johnny123 on Jaya's Games reviewed it, sharing, This is the gold standard here, people, the kind of survival shooter that other survival shooters aspire aspire to be. While the story and writing maybe leave something to be desired, there is an excellent balance of exploration, scavenging, rescuing survivors, and of course, ripping through zombies. This third installment is huge, polished, and filled with genuinely great zombie tension. Although the difficulty curve is maybe a little wonky, being quite easy in the early stages. And yes, the formula is being repeated, but additions like the survivor recruitment and management elevated above previous entries. And there's this interesting quality of internal nostalgia within this series coming back to this more familiar setting. Fly Anvil did a fantastic job growing and fleshing out this series over the years. It picked up a daily second and weekly fifth, but whatever game it was that topped it back in the day has seemingly been deleted? I genuinely do wonder what it was. But here's another example where the most memorable game is the one that stood the test of time. Having made four installments in this series, three of them sharing the same setting, and the golden age of Flash gaming's falling behind, it made sense to take this series beyond the browser. This week saw the release of Decision Red Days. It's currently only available on Steam, but once again touts a unique blend of action RPG, survival, and tower defense mechanics. This time with an all-new 3D aesthetic, although at times the animations can be a little off. Generally, it's been really cool to see Fly Anvil's style grow and evolve until reaching this point. I think it's still a huge step up visually. There are loads of weapons, the ability to expand your team, capturing and managing settlements, and day and night cycles that make things really freaky. All of that feels like yet another excellent step forward for the series. However, reception thus far has been mixed. It's currently sitting at a 60% positive on Steam. 
Fly Anvil seemingly finally embraced the name decision, adding in plenty of new survival mechanics for the player to weigh and consider, but it may be tipped too far, with survivors constantly needing food and rest. Made even more aggravating when your available stash for resources is kind of pathetic. The deeper in the game you get, the easier it is to manage some of these trade-offs, but it makes for a grueling early game. The cool elements of exploration are instead replaced with constantly needing to tend to survivors, and many players understandably have put it down and refunded within an hour or two. It takes a while for this one to get going. Maybe you'll be one of the ones who doesn't find this as obnoxious, but throw in some pretty broken AI that makes your companions feel useless at best and suicidal at worst, among many other bugs, I really can't currently recommend it. Take it with a grain of salt as 60% of people did recommend it, so perhaps you'll be in that category still enjoying the game as is. But I'd also like to point to the fact that within a day of release, the development team already released an announcement of the first major update they are working on. They seem committed to taking and implementing constructive criticism and are seemingly in it for the long haul to support and improve the game. For now, I'd suggest maybe a tentative wishlist and follow only, so then you can keep tabs on future announcements and see how the game takes shape over time, maybe picking it up down the line. Next on the list is Swords and Souls, a game that came from a pair of cousins who together founded Soul Game Studios. It's worth noting that every creator on this list has other games and projects falling outside of their most popular series represented here, but Soul Game Studio are the only ones whose other games all technically exist in the same universe. These Rayman-like blue-gray characters are all souls and have starred in numerous hit games. I'll touch on each of them lightly here, as they are not the focus, and because I already have a flashlight video that goes in depth on the series and its developers. It feels a little repetitious to bring these guys up again in another video, but hey, the original video covering these guys in detail never got a ton of views, so maybe I can point a few of you in that direction. It all started with The Soul Driver back in 2012. It's a crazy taxi-like game where you're out on the lam, dodging around obstacles and police while upgrading your car and trying to make it further each time. It's an incredibly polished debut game, relatively simple, but the clear care and attention they put into it all added up to a game that holds up incredibly well ten years later. Later on, that very same year, these two greatly surpassed a high bar they had already set for themselves, with their sophomore release, Rogue Soul. This auto-runner platformer has a medieval setting, requiring you to jump, dodge, and bash your way through the ideal route of each level, working to collect loot, avoid or kill enemies, and conquer unique challenges. It's highly skill-based with only a few buttons to control, existing squarely in the territory of easy to learn, hard to master. Two years after that, in 2014, they released their first sequel. It added more of a story, but not so much that it gets in the way. This sequel kept everything that made the original so solid and enjoyable, but has a lot more replayability. Add in things like upgrades, boss battles, and so much more that all come together to make Rogue Soul 2 one of the all-time classics. In between the two Rogue Soul games, they tried something a little different with The Gentleman. It's the only game of theirs to not feature soul in the title. It's also the only game of theirs to have not won any daily or weekly awards on Newgrounds. Coincidence? That'll teach them to omit soul from their game titles. With their other games being focused on simple mechanics with upgrades and incremental progression and large replayability, The Gentleman is a departure from that, acting as a more typical level-based platforming puzzle game that's typical of the Flash game world. It's maybe not as showy or unique as their other titles, but it still carries that high level of polish, and introduces more unique and surprising mechanics along the way that keep all 50 levels feeling fresh and exciting. And of course, they couldn't resist slipping some boss battles in there. I actually typed a winky face into the script there. Did I do that for myself when I wrote this? I, I have no idea anymore. What, what was my plan?
While Rogue Soul 2 was their most critically well-received game, sweeping the Newgrounds Awards that week, it is instead another game of theirs that in the long term was elevated above the rest with their current highest score and play count of any of those Soul games, and that is Swords and Souls. First off, this game is huge and features a gameplay loop that is wholly unique. You play a collection of minigames to improve your stats, fight it out in these auto battler showdowns, live as long as you can while accumulating money and gear. Eventually, you'll square off in a battle you cannot currently win. Then it's time to take things back to camp to upgrade a plethora of things that will help you become stronger, level up faster, and earn new skills and abilities. Put yourself to the test with more training minigames until you've hit a new plateau. Take your leveled up knight out into the field to crush the foes that were so recently a challenge. Pushing these arena battles again to the limit, bringing it back to camp, and doing it all over again. There is so much variety here, with 5 minigames, 30 arena levels to conquer, 44 unique enemies and bosses to master, a survival mode, a home to upgrade, museum to fill up. This this game can easily take hours to complete, and the second you're finished, you'll likely want to wipe your progress and start all over to beat it more quickly, applying new strategies and putting your refined minigame skills to the test. The game is deep, satisfying, creative, innovative, basically inventing a genre of its own, and is an all-time gem. The best part about it is that free online Swords and Souls also serves as a perfect demo for what came after. The full sequel, Swords and Souls Never Seen, available on PC and the Nintendo Switch. Never Seen is the name of the world this game takes place in. It follows the same gameplay loop as the Flash original expanding beyond the arena with a full world to explore and a fairly basic story that adds a nice layer of depth to the experience. This one currently has a 93% approval rating, so you can feel a little safer in that purchase, with negative reviews mainly coming from people who dislike the main gameplay loop, which is why I recommend testing out the original Flash version, treating it as a demo or a proof of concept before making your purchase. Basically, every aspect is improved in Never Seen, but at least you'll know before making your final purchase whether the fundamentals of the game appeal to you. If you can't find somewhere to reliably test it out within browser, go check out Blue Maxima's Flashpoint. Really, if you want to revisit any of these old Flash games, that's going to be your best bet for doing so, but since I'm hyping this one up so specifically, I, I should draw attention to it here. Taking things beyond what was done in the browser game. The minigames have largely been reworked to all be made much more fun. Let's be honest, a couple of those original five were a little tedious, but Never Seen refined and improved each of them, as well as enhancing the combat, adding the ability to eventually capture creatures like Pokemon to fight at your side, or hiring out mercenaries for any extra hard showdowns. There's also little bits of fun metagaming that you can do, collecting these little children hidden around the map, and filling out your vault with all sorts of collectibles. As if having two of the best Flash games of all time wasn't enough, this one really solidified Soul Games as dynamite developers who have a distinct, genre-defying vision for their games, and who have seemingly perfected the art of the sequel. Considering what an insane step up Never Seen was on every front, starting from an already fantastic foundation, it has me all the more excited for the fact that they've teased wanting to someday make Rogue Soul 3. We can only hope. Next up is a game that only ever had one Flash entry and one subsequent release, Chibi Knight. This one comes from the legendary Flash developer Nick Pasto, aka Bomb Tunes or Pesto Force. He is not only an incredibly talented programmer, but often is the artist on his own games as he was for Chibi Knight. But his full catalog of classic browser games includes the likes of Aqua Slug, Boss Bash, Trick or Treat Adventure, Castle Crashing the Beard, Pico Blast, Portal Defenders, and, well, legitimately too many others to mention in this little intro. Perhaps most notably, transcending the web game space was a Bobo's Big Adventure. It's one of the videos I'm most proud of on this channel, so I can't help but 
bring that one to everyone's attention, while also using it as an example of how hardworking and dedicated Nick can be, as well as how creative and entertaining his games are. Chibi Knight was a solo project released in 2010. Well, nearly solo. A major hook of the game was that Nick created it alongside his preschooler daughter, Bella, who voiced the main character. Level up! as well as throwing in bits of her childish imagination into the game, brainstorming ideas with her father who then brought them to life. After two years of work, this father-daughter combo released the deeply charming adventure RPG to universal acclaim. It earned the daily first and weekly second on Newgrounds and has two million plays on that site alone. It was heavily influenced by Zelda 2, with Nick saying that is his favorite RPG of all time, as well as pulling from sources like Castle Crashers, turning that odd combo into something deeply personal and wholly unique. The custom soundtrack by Brian Holmes adds a lot to the game, channeling the spirit of those that inspired it. Chibi Knight has top-notch designs and art direction, an endearing childlike quality, and remains challenging but not inaccessible while simply being all-around adorable good fun. How often do you encounter a game that is both this cute and entertaining? The bright, colorful, bouncy quality may steer some serious gamers away, but they can shove it. It's about an hour long of gleeful delights that balances its action with a more casual experience that makes it perfect for all ages, especially younger audiences, as you might expect with one of the developers being only five years old. Nick ran with this success and got to work on Super Chibi Night, releasing in 2015. Right away, I want to draw attention to the fact that this is by far the cheapest game on the list, selling for only $5. The base game is about three hours long, but can easily take two or three times more than that if you want to fully explore what it has to offer. With the amount of stuff that can easily be missed when advancing through the game, with fully alternate paths in many areas, it basically insists on being replayed to see everything it has to offer. With young Bella now being 8 years old and returning as the titular character, it seems that even more of her influence was poured into the game, giving it this beautiful storybook quality that anyone can enjoy, but becomes a perfect entry point for any young child looking for an introduction to the wonders of video games and game development. Indie Games web blog summed up the experience incredibly well. It captures a child's wonder in its adventure, meeting danger with positivity and joy alongside determination. So on top of everything, the game has good morals and a strong message. It can on occasion feel a little unfair with things like insta-death spikes, but that aligns with Nick's own retro game influences that also shaped Bobo's big adventure as well as many of his other works. So in that sense, it's nice to see some of his own voice and influences in the game, with him taking the ruthless difficulty of the games he grew up with and putting a more modern spin on them to give the next generation their own small taste of that experience. Experience. The sequel adds upgrades, mounts, quests, secret areas, and more of a free-roaming approach that greatly expands on the original. There's no filler here. The game is packed to the brim with new ideas, monsters, and things to encounter. I would say the only thing I'm really missing from this personally would be some form of co-op. It would be the ultimate game to play between a parent and child if you were somehow able to play together. But instead, maybe you can do a bit of hot seat multiplayer passing things around and taking turns. It's currently sitting at an 89 on Steam, which is still really high, with negative reviews pointing to frame rate drops, clunky controls, and a few other technical issues. The difficulties people have had with either a mouse and keyboard or controller seem super inconsistent, so be wary on that. And there's the odd selection of other complaints that stem more from gamer preferences. While the vast majority of players were not marred by these different problems, it's something to be mindful of going in. It even has a free demo available online if you want to test it out for yourself, but this is a browser-only demo, so it may not be representative of how the game will control and perform when installed properly on your PC. 
if you pick up the game, maybe play it for 20 minutes right away before you exit that refund window just in case. Things to keep in mind when looking into that purchase. Considering the success of the original and the bargain pricing of this game, it's a damn shame to see how underappreciated it's been on Steam. And the last game on the list, Madness Project Nexus. Right at the top of this one, let me address something that I know will get asked, as it gets asked at least a couple times in the comments of nearly every video I upload. Yes, I am still making the Madness Flashlight video. I uploaded one years ago on a different channel, it was like 11 minutes long, and made in just a few days to coincide with Madness Day that year. It was rushed, far from comprehensive, and I think did the fan creations of the Madness series a bit of a disservice, breezing past them in only a sentence or two. This revised video will not have that problem. The Madness series is the brainchild of creator Matt Jolly, aka Crinkles. Dating back almost 20 years to July 25th, 2002, the series has endured all that time being painstakingly hand-animated frame by frame by one individual. There is the long-running mainline continuity following key characters such as Hank, Sanford, Deimos, as well as wild, increasingly absurd secondary characters like the Sheriff, Jesus, and Tricky the Clown. The series may seem formulaic, but constantly strives to wow and one-up itself. That escalation has kept people coming back for years, eager to see what might come next. As passionate as that fandom is and highly regarded that the animations are, it's almost nothing compared to the Madness games. Again, there are hundreds of fan-made contributions. I made my own back in the day. I have a developer commentary on that if anyone's at all interested. It's a pretty low-key video. But Crinkles was directly involved in three browser-based Madness games. The first being Madness Interactive, a simple but very fun game that looks and feels much like the early animations in the franchise. Which makes sense, it came out when there was only two animations at that point, and the world already felt big enough to add to with a game. The controls, physics, and gameplay are all incredibly smooth, the sandbox mode is insanely fun. It's simple, but I've probably spent dozens of hours in this little game. It's just damn good fun and feels like a real-time version of the animations. Pretty much everything a fan could have gone looking for. Madness Accelerant saw Crinkles working with Newgrounds founder Tom Falp, who programmed, and prominent artist and one-time Newgrounds staff member Mind Chamber do Doing the art. It was made as a celebration for the third annual Madness Day, where fans all submit their tributes to the series, and remains among the best Madness games ever made. Pretty well the only one that ranks above it came in 2012. Crinkles put together a team of A-listers to bring us Madness Project Nexus. This one is far less stylistic, taking things back to the basics of Madness Interactive, now including the much larger universe that had grown over the years. Project Nexus has a proper story, more complex mechanics that empower the player rather than getting in the way, all adding to the glorious, high-stakes, hyper-violent gameplay. Project Nexus, classic as it's now known, remains the seventh most played game in the history of Newgrounds, landing just above Alien Hominid, which coincidentally also has its 20th anniversary this year, only a few weeks after Madness. A Kickstarter for the sequel to Project Nexus was funded in 2014, and after a long, arduous road, the newly titled Madness Project Nexus, hence why the original is now sub subtitled classic, was released last year. Seven years it spent in development. While I'm sure that long wait turned some people away, with fans spending years worrying it would never release, but it was all well worth the wait. And with that extra post-Friday night funkin' attention and wave of newcomers to the fandom, it gave the game the boost it needed to soar at release. It has over 8,000 reviews on Steam and an overwhelmingly positive score of 97%. This is the game I'll likely have the least to say about as it performed like crazy. 
It has a lengthy story mode with an option to play it with up to four player co-op, a fun to mess around in arena mode, and a playground that feels like a throwback to the sandbox nature of Madness Interactive. If you enjoy the Madness series and have enjoyed any of those three previous games, it likely still won't prepare you for this release. I'd recommend that violent arcade run and gun gameplay to just about anyone. It's the game on the list that is least in need of a shout out from me, hence why I kind of tucked it at the back of the list. But who knows, it could always be new to someone, and it helps hype up my own release of the upcoming Madness Flashlight. Maybe if you're unfamiliar with the series, it'll give you a chance to familiarize yourself a little bit before that big full video. As I'm closing things up, there will be links to the Steam pages of all five of these games. And while I would encourage you to wishlist or purchase any of them that are of interest to you, I very selfishly want to say that if you only wishlist one of these games, I hope it'll be Repella Fella. Hopefully this video will help you both rediscover old web series that we all loved back in the day, while hopefully also paying back those developers in some small way for the endless hours of free entertainment they gave us, and thanking them for sticking with their games and series for so long. There's always a bit of a hurdle trying to encourage players who grew up playing these games for free to ask them to now spend money on the sequel. But I think more and more people are aware the web game world isn't profitable anymore, and that selling these sequels is the only way these developers can make a living. It'll be a happy day for the indie scene when that stigma finally dies off. At one point, this video was going to be 10 series that made the leap from browser. But as with pretty well every video I've ever made, I had more to say on the subject than I expected. It felt tough to really smush down these games' as history without removing most of the interesting details. I wanted it to be both a reminder to long-term fans and potentially an introduction to newcomers. It's a hard thing to balance. And so now, my list of games that I'm aware that exist on Steam or consoles is well beyond an additional 10. I could easily make this its own sub-series within Flashlight, looking at five games at a time, spotlighting them and their developers that deserve our support. Sharing them this way allows me to do it more quickly and readily without doing the full scope of research I would need for a full series analysis. Who knows how long it would have gotten me to get around to covering Decision, whereas the game could benefit from our support this week at launch. And down the line, I could happily still make full videos on any of these games and series, if I haven't already, as I would then include developer interviews, deeper reviews and analysis, and loads of cool stories and behind-the-scenes details that there would be no room for in this video. So if people enjoy this concept, I'll happily make more of them. Maybe you guys could let me know if you would prefer I spent more or less time on specific details. Generally, whatever I could do to make it better and more useful for you as the consumer who could potentially be spending money on these games. That's all for now. Thank you all so much for watching. Again, those links are down below. I'll have a playlist in the end cards of all my flashlight videos. Thank you to patrons of the channel, and I hope to see you all again soon.